I'm going to slip behind the screen of PowerPoint. You'll still be able to see me. Um, so as Kristen just said, this is the 25th anniversary and that theme of unlearning, I think, matters here when it has to do with Harriet Taylor Mill. We have a lot to unlearn about her, but also about unlearning about authorship, about collaboration, about selfhood, and about those myths that roll around in our heads much of the time. So I think unlearning is perfect for when it comes to Harriet. So you've signed up for a lecture on Harriet Taylor Mill. Does anybody out there have a clue who she is? Most people don't, so don't be alarmed if you don't. If I say she was John Stuart Mill's wife, a few of you might go, oh, I recognize his name, but who is she? Harriet was a Victorian radical, a feminist economist, a philosopher, and the author of The Enfranchisement of Women. Oh, and she was Mrs. John Stuart Mill, but they were only married for seven years. For the 20 years before their wedding, they worked and traveled together while she was married to another man. Got your attention? I invite you to follow the breadcrumbs through the forest of her life. So we'll also spend some time thinking about what it means to be an author, a co-author, what it means to be an angry Victorian woman, and how best to change the world we live in. Because this is Women's History Month, I'd like to begin by telling you a little bit about how I came to be interested in Harriet. Like every philosophy major in the last hundred years, I read On Liberty as an undergraduate. The dedication of that work reads in part to the beloved memory of her who was the inspirer and in part the author of all that is best in my writings. Like all that I have written for many years, it belongs as much to her as to me. We discussed this passage in class for about 20 seconds. The gist was wink, wink, nod, nod, yeah, right. Harriet collaborated with John on one of the most important books in philosophy, not likely. I went on to graduate work in aesthetics and didn't think much more about Harriet for the next 20 years. Then in the summer of 1992, I was in Oxford to study Victorian women novelist for the summer. Since I was hearing Mill's name in connection to these Victorian ideas and remembering that dedication, I decided on a lark to spend an afternoon finding out a bit more about this mysterious wife of his. Little did I know that that afternoon would stretch into the next 10 years of work. I began in the Bodleian Library. The reserve librarian pointed me in the direction of a wall, I'm not kidding, full of biographical dictionaries that include every earl, every intellectual, and practically anyone who sniffed in British history. I checked the Harriet Taylor Mill entry, nothing. I tried Harriet Taylor, nothing. I tried her maiden name, Harriet Hardy, nothing. I revisited the librarian who, puzzled at the absence of the wife of John Stuart Mill, suggested I visit the Fawcett Library of Women's History in London. The next time I went to the city, I decided to spend another afternoon checking out this source. At this Library of Women's History, again, nothing on Harriet. However, since John was a feminist, he had an entry at the Women's History Library. Listed among the archives that held his papers was the Mill Taylor Collection housed at the London School of Economics. Well, that was only a couple of tube stops away, so off I went. When I arrived at the archives of the LSE, I asked to see the papers of Harriet Taylor Mill. They said, which ones? I said, all of them. The librarians began hauling out box after box of papers, manuscripts, passports, pictures, sketches, wills. I was stunned. I asked the archivist, who had clearly been in the library since the beginning of time, who had transcribed all of these documents. Clearly, I was a complete ignoramus when it came to Harriet. Her reply was simple. 
No one. Needless to say, I was hooked. In 1992, 134 years after her death, no one had bothered to transcribe all of her writings. So over the course of the next few years, I did. Then I wrote her first biography. I hope it won't be the last. The point of this long-winded introduction, there's a great deal of work to be done in recovering the history of women in the world. Even if, like me, you feel unprepared and inadequate to the task, don't ignore the call when it comes. The world can't afford to lose half of its history. That's one thing we need to unlearn. I'd like to introduce you to Harriet. We will talk about Harriet's philosophy, but I want to first talk about the intimate side of her life, beginning with her biography. She was the daughter of Thomas and Harriet Hardy, not that Thomas Hardy, but that Thomas Hardy that you're thinking about was a cousin of him. Harriet was born in 1807 at this house, 8 Beckford Row in Walworth, and lived in this house with her seven brothers and sisters until she married John Taylor when she was 18. Her favorite brother, Arthur Hardy, moved to Australia and his relatives are still there. I had the chance to meet them. Her sister, Caroline, will be, is the only sister she had and she'll become important later on. Harriet and her husband moved to Christopher Street, not far from Finsbury Square. Not in this actual house, it was raised during the Blitz, but at this location. Harriet married John Taylor when she was 18. She had two children, Herbert and Algernon, in the first four years of her marriage. Pregnant with Helen, her last child, she met this man named John Stuart Mill. So think about this, as she's getting bigger and bigger and bigger in pregnancy, she's also falling in love with another man. Harriet published poems, book reviews, and articles for the monthly repository from 1831 to 33, those first couple of years that she knew John. She wrote a long draft of an article for the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge on the man, William Caxton, who brought the printing press to England. After a brief separation from her husband in 1833, she moved to a house of her own. This allowed her to continue her intimate friendship with John and her formal marriage with her husband. John spent weekends with her and they traveled frequently during the following 18 years. In the biography, I argue, I argue that she discovered that she had contracted syphilis from her husband during her last pregnancy and that that's why she probably didn't have sex with either her husband or John Mill after Helen was born, but that's another story. John Taylor bought this house on Kent Terrace, a very fashionable location just off of Regent Park, in order to try to persuade Harriet to stay with him. It didn't work. Her parents too were experiencing a rise in their standard of living. Harriet's father inherited this property, Burksgate, from an uncle in 1836. As you can see, it's still quite a lovely estate. It was so much fun to go to local history libraries and rely on the kindness of strangers to sometimes talk my way into these houses. Um, in fact, I was able to just walk up and they let me take pictures on the inside as well as the outside of this one. Very quickly, in 1840 and early 1850, despite her near invalid condition, Harriet wrote a number of newspaper articles on domestic violence. She wrote a chapter of John's Principles of Political Economy in 48. Her husband, John Taylor, died in 1849, and Harriet and John married two years later, the same year that she wrote The Enfranchisement of Women. They also published a pamphlet on domestic violence that was before the legislature, and finally, during the mid-1850s, Harriet worked 
with John on manuscripts that would become On Liberty and his autobiography, neither of which were published until after her death in 1858. We'll talk about each of these separately later and in more detail, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what she wrote. Harriet and John lived in this house uh, near Greenwich after they married, and it was in this house that On Liberty was written. There too, I talked my way into some interior shots. Harriet died in 1858 in this room in a hotel in Avignon, France. She hid the keys of her chest containing her personal correspondence behind the curtains, probably not those particular curtains, but the curtains. And um, she instructed that all of her uh, correspondence be burnt, and it was. John wrote to a friend, the spring of my life is broken. Harriet and John were both buried in this grave and John bought a house overlooking the cemetery and lived there for much of the remainder of his life. So Harriet who? These are the raw facts of her life, but who was she on the inside? Historians have answered the Harriet who question by labeling her a philosopher in petticoats one of the meanest, dullest ladies in literary history, a monument of nasty self-regard as lacking in charm as in grandeur, a tempestuous shrew, a female autocrat, a domineering, perverse, selfish, invalid woman, a vain and vituperative, proud and pestilent masochist, a very clever, imaginative, passionate, intense, imperious, paranoid, unpleasant woman. In short, she's been branded in everything short of Wicked Witch of the West by historians of philosophy. Why, why have critics been so hard on Harriet? I think the answer is complicated and includes the usual suspects like historians sexism, but also less obvious issues. And here I wanna put a plug in for Menaka Phillips, who's gonna be talking more about her Harriet in her class on Tuesday. So sign up for it. It's from 3.15 to 5.15, and you'll see what the new generation have to say about Harriet. I'm gonna focus on a couple of reasons. First, I think historians judge Harriet harshly because they simply didn't and still don't understand how Harriet and John lived and worked together. When Harriet stepped outside her marriage to enter a passionate, intense, nameless relationship with John, they began an experiment in living. They abandoned the idea of an isolated self. They began to think of themselves as what I call a collaborative self. This way of being together laid the foundation for how they then worked together. But I think first we have to unlearn what we think we know about the self. So what is this collaborative self? Well, it is not about giving up who one is. This new integrated self was not an absorption of either one into the other. Tension, actually, within the whole begin defines their new collaboration. Dialogue, not monologue, created their new voice. The danger, as they saw it, was conformity, not disagreement. I imagine their life as a kind of counterpart, like point, like a Bach fugue. Sometimes one voice leads, at other times another voice predominates. But the tension results in harmony, a harmony created by not being at the same place at the same time. Harriet played a role similar to John as thinker and co-author, yet her ideas, as you'll see in a moment, are much more radical. When this duo argued, instead of adopting one or the other of the differing positions, reconciliation is sought that's more subtle, in fact, truer than either of their original views. Harriet's life is not about victimhood. She was not John's intellectual nursemaid, nor was she 
so it was this some kind of fairy tale that cast Harriet as a sleeping beauty who needed the prince to kiss her so she would become a functioning, functioning intellectual being. Harriet was as active in building this new combined self as John was. Unfortunately, Harriet and John didn't live a fairy tale of equality either. John was effusive in his praise of Harriet's contributions to their writings, but I suspect he never understood the implications of the second shift of household chores that she had. Harriet managed the household and wrote. She was a co-author, but he was not a co-household manager. John seemed to have had a lifelong incapacity to perform even the most obvious practical acts of life. For example, at seven years old, he was reading Plato in Greek. There was a smart little boy, but he couldn't button his shirt. Compensating for John's ineptitude became a habit with Harriet. Once while Harriet traveled in Europe, she had to direct the extermination of a rat on their property in England because John, who was living in the house at the time, couldn't figure out how to do it. Without Harriet to order supplies, the maid ran out of candles, soap, and potatoes. In one of the more ludicrous episodes of his life with Harriet, John worriedly reported to Harriet that the house needed considerably more coal in January than from May to August. Amazingly, one of the most brilliant philosophers of this or any period could not grasp the parallel between coal weather and the need for more coal. Sometimes John's ineptitude had sad consequences. In a very poignant letter to her daughter during the final two weeks of her life, Harriet reports, the fact is we always get the last seats on the railway carriage, as I cannot run on quick, and if John goes on, he never succeeds. I always find him running up and down, looking lost in astonishment. Given John's practical incompetence, we can charitably assume that John's lack of contribution to the nitty-gritty of his life with Harriet was due to inability, not unwillingness. In any case, the result was Harriet carried the full weight of keeping their lives organized. Those who complained that Harriet did not work out the details of her arguments or that her ideas were scattered must also wonder how much more complete her drafts might have been if John could be counted on to kill a rat on his own. Harriet recognized the lack of, of equality in her life with John and she showed her anger about that injustice, both to him and in her public writings, as we'll discuss later. The cooperation that Harriet and John enjoyed created an opportunity for each of the participants to expand their lives by sharing some of the gendered pleasures and duties. Clearly not all, as we've just discussed, but for example, John performed two of the tasks specifically ordained by Victorian society for the lady of the house. Serving tea and playing the piano for your spouse. After Helen left home, her, she wrote to her mother that she always thought fondly of the time of day when John came home and poured tea for Harriet. Further, instead of the typical wife, soothing her husband at the end of his tiring and often troubled public day, John volunteered to play for Harriet when she needed distraction. Harriet's son, Algernon, recalled John improvising at the piano, but only when asked to do so by my mother. At the piano, John would conjure up storms, sunrises, marches, and other images as he entertained Harriet. Meanwhile, Harriet assumed the responsibilities that mostly men had. She determined the fonts to use and made other aesthetic decisions about his work. She renegotiated publishing contracts. 
Playing the piano, serving tea, financial responsibilities are merely the surface evidence for a commitment to degendering roles. They were unlearning. They were unlearning gender roles, even those that were legally binding. For example, six weeks before their wedding, John, in a very formal presentation, sent a letter to her announcing that he would never assert any of the legal rights to control his future wife's actions, body, or money. They succeeded, I think, in escaping many, not all, but many of the prescribed roles at a level few Victorians achieved. Passion ignites easily at the beginning of a forbidden love. Early in their relationship, Harriet croons, no one ever loved me as you love me, nor made their love one half quarter so happy. 25 years later, John pouts, this is the first time since we've been married, my darling wife, that we have been separated and I do not like it at all. For John, Harriet's letters were, quote, what keeps the blood going in the veins. Without them, John assured her he would have a sort of hibernating existence like those animals found on the inside of a rock. His letters were full not only of the abstract pronouncements of love, but the intimate physicality of passion. He sent a thousand kisses and... Harriet, he, he even asked Harriet to kiss his next letter just in the middle of the first line, the kiss will come safe and I shall savor it. Passion of a 24-year-old for her secret lover is to be expected, but romance sustained for 20 years deserves attention. As we shall dis discuss in a moment, the erotic quality of their relationship is often a feature of those who create together. Even more remarkable, Harriet and John's personal and professional alliance allowed a very un-Victorian display of women's anger in publications and in private conversations. Harriet was enraged about child abuse, child custody judgments, conformity, domestic violence, the French Revolution, legal, religious, and marriage institutions. She was exasperated with Chartist, John Mill, Thomas Carlyle, her children, her husband, her parents, her siblings, judges, politicians, doctors, and women writers who did not support women's equality, among others. This may be the main reason why historians haven't liked her so much. In 1844, John shows Harriet his correspondence with Auguste Comte. Comte had written that because women's brains were smaller, they must remain permanently subjected to men. To this misogynist argument, Harriet replies with ripe, open contempt. Much more subtly, Harriet conveys her frustration with John's mealy-mouthed response to Comte. When she begins a sentence, if the truth is on the side we, I, defend, I imagine Comte would rather not see it. That strike through of the we and a replacement with I would have cut John to the quick. Harriet was annoyed not only at John's intellectual arguments, she openly fumed at John after he had written that his relationship with her might squelch his prospects. Being about to leave her husband in order to sustain their relationship, Harriet could not be counted on for sympathy about John's career. Good heavens, have you at last arrived at fearing to be obscure and insignificant? What can I say to that, but by all means, pursue your brilliant and important career. Am I one to choose to be the cause of that person I love feels himself reduced 
to obscure and insignificant? Good God, what is the love of two equals to do with making obscure and insignificant? If ever you could be obscure and insignificant, you are so whatever happens. And certainly a person who did not feel contempt for the very idea the words create is not one to brave the world. Woo! She did not hide her anger, but neither did John punish her for it. Harriet expressed anger, both personal and abstract, without fear of rejection or abandonment. She, if you're going to create together, you must be able to be brutally honest. Few Victorian women would have had the courage to confront any man with this kind of sarcasm, much less the famous child prodigy and philosopher John Stuart Mill. I would argue that this is a rare place for a woman to be even today. Think about the recent experience of Neera Tandon, for example. Demonstrations of passion and anger require trust. Harriet and John also shared the most intimate experiences of anyone's life. Both before and after they married, Harriet and John disclosed themselves to each other with complete openness. Money matters are still considered one of the most personal details of our lives. How many of you know the financial state of your dearest friends? Even before they wed, Harriet discussed with John whether and how much he should loan to family, friends, or colleagues. When they considered retirement, they consulted one another on how much capital they would need to ensure their security. The intimacy of gossip reveals another element of their closeness. In their letters and personal writings, Harriet and John exchanged gossip about those they didn't like, as well as giving each other emotional support, health reports, and political news. The most charming moments for the reader are those where they chatter about humorous events. For example, when John was in Europe, he sent a detailed travelogue of everything he saw every day and the fleas he battled at night. In Greece, the fleas were particularly bad. He writes, since I began the last sentence, I caught a flea in the act of getting into my nostril. The fleas are now attacking in columns and firing into many parts of my body at once. A hundred times since I began writing, I've stripped my trousers up and my socks down when numbers of the enemy jumped from their encampment. I'm afraid they will consider my clothes as their permanent quarters. Not exactly the picture of John Stuart Mill the public saw. I can see Harriet cackling as she read that missive in Blackheath Park. The most poignant view of Harriet and John comes from their dependency on one another during hard times. Two periods will illustrate the Carlisle disaster and John Taylor's death. Only a few years after they met, John arrived at Harriet's house with the stunning news that his maid had accidentally burnt the only handwritten draft of the first part of the French Revolution, which the author Thomas Carlyle had loaned him. The only one. Harriet was John's source of strength in facing the humiliating confession he had to make. In his time of shame, John did not turn to India House colleagues, nor to his parents or his siblings. He turned to Harriet. Harriet, in turn, depended on John during the most tragic period of her life, the death of her first husband. During the weeks Harriet nursed John, or John Taylor, John Mill was always available by a letter to share the grief, anxiety, momentary hope, frustration, and finally sorrow. After Taylor died, John leaned on, Harriet leaned on John to help with questions about where to bury Taylor, who to deliver the 
sermon and whether or not it would be proper for John to attend the funeral. A particularly awkward question. Through the whole ordeal, John supported Harriet even when exhaustion made her confrontational. The death of your husband, even if, or perhaps particularly if, you are estranged, is one of the most private experiences. Harriet shared it only with John, not her sister, not her siblings, nobody, just John. Through funny moments and bitter ones, through 21 years of unmarried and seven years of married life, Harriet and John relied on each other for counsel and for love. They divulged their secrets and their losses. Nothing was too awful or too trivial to relate, even fleas up your nose. It is this collaborative self that I think historians have failed to understand. And this is why they cannot understand how they worked together. I believe that Harriet's greatest legacy was not merely in what she said, but how they wrote together. And that begins with building a new kind of self. So let's switch to a second barrier to understanding how they worked. One of the reasons historians failed to understand Harriet and John's way of working is a myth that haunts Western philosophers. It is represented, I think, by Rodin's sculpture, The Thinker. Commentators assume that the highest level of philosophical achievement is, can only be produced by the lone genius. If you've studied Greek plays, you may recall in the Eumenides, Aeschylus writes that Orestes didn't kill a blood relative when he killed his mother because mothers are merely the incubators to the father's sperm, which is a kind of tiny rolled up human being that's in every sperm. Plato gives the philosophical equivalent to this biological silliness in the symposium. When Plato describes a person who's pregnant with philosophical ideas, and this is the crucial bit, who has never had a partner, his pregnancy, we can only smile, requires only one parent. Now, he likes having someone around to ease the pain of delivery of some of his philosophical babies, but the ideas are his. So this myth of single authorship has been influencing our assumptions at least as long as the Greeks, and that sole creator is always male. Another thing to unlearn. Now, co-authorship is routine in scientific papers, but in the humanities, especially philosophy, it's still rare. Where can we find resistance to this lone ranger myth in the humanities? Let's look at an example of creative collaborative work in a genre that's usually authored by a single person to see what we can learn from them. Let's begin with this novel written jointly. Notice, by in 1872, Harriet Beecher Stowe and five others composed this novel, half a dozen of one, half a dozen of the other, an everyday novel. The process of writing, she wrote, began with what the friends call a solid sitting, where we were baptized into each other's spirit. There's a delicate balance between being baptized into each other's spirit and retaining your own voice. Co-authorship is a plurality of independent and unmerged voices bent to the same goal. And that goal is often radical. In collaborative works, it is easier for folks to come together to critique their own culture. In this novel, the challenge was to racial inequality. For Harriet and John, it was to women's inequality. Powers of Two, which I highly recommend if you're at all interested in this concept of collaborative uh, work together, 
recently brought together psychological and sociological and even neurological uh, research on creative duos. And it examined a number of examples from McCartney and Lennon to Marie and P Pierre Curie. The author describes a common process that runs through all of these examples. And I'm not gonna go through the entire book, but when couples meet, they have to build confidence in their collaboration by sharing sensibilities, reciprocal ideas, and values. They learn to trust each other, in short, because they each know that their partner will always have their back. They learn to take risks together. All of this requires time, lots and lots of time together. One example from pop culture is from the Dave Chappelle show. Commentators are always asking, who is the real author of the Dave Chappelle show, Brennan or Chappelle? Brennan says, ultimately, me and Dave are the only guys who know how the show works and the only guys who know who did what. We go into a room together and we would come out with the sketches. The creation happens in privacy is exactly why no outsider can tell the pair's story. It is one of the reasons those who don't collaborate don't understand those who do. Why do partners seek out a quiet room of their own? Because when you're doing something naughty or against the grain, or you want to change the world, you need to have someone you can turn to and say, are we crazy? And your partner says, yeah, and we'll do it anyway. By making a pack of your own, you're able to risk more. A duo tends to treasure their secrets. They let go of self-monitoring. Creating this way is sometimes erotic. They begin to use we and ours naturally. There's even neuroscientific evidence that they don't remember who did what because they literally stop coding memories that way. When I wrote the biography of Harriet Taylor Mill, I didn't have any of this background in psychological and sociology of pairs. I simply tried to describe what was going on between Harriet and John. That's why I said that they created what I call the collaborative self. Recent research confirms that description. Creative couples do not meld into one muddled person when they create as a plural subject. Co-authorship is a dance of power, a coming together and a pushing apart. One creative duo said, two people do more than get to know each other. They absorb each other. So the self gets bigger even as it becomes more permeable. The more we overlap, the larger we become, much larger than we were as two individuals. I stumbled on this lesson by observing the intimate life of Harriet and John. Most philosophers to this day, I think, are blind to this way of being and creating. Witness the historians who still insist that however Harriet helped John in his intellectual work, her effort did not, did not, did not amount to co-authorship. Here again, a list is instructive. John Robson writes, the implication is strong that John wrote a draft, a milled wrote a draft, then went through it with Harriet. The process may have been repeated, but eventually the final manuscript emerged again composed in full by Mill. This position is supported by the common experience of the way husbands and wives collaborate. Jack Stillinger says, it is a reasonably clear, in fact, that Harriet was no originator of ideas. However much she may have aided Mill by ordinary wifely discussions and debate, it is unfortunate that Mill did not simply thank his wife for encouragement 
Perhaps we're also transcribing a manuscript or making an index and let it go at that. Alan Ryan suggests that it would be more foolish to exaggerate Harriet's role than to deny it. I will show that Harriet and John's collaboration tended more and more towards co-authorship. Perhaps I foolishly exaggerate. I've been called worse. We've discussed how Harriet and John created this joint self and why current research shows how that serves as a necessary condition for joint creativity. Now let's turn to the evidence that they really did create together. Joint, collaborative, combined, co-authored. When does a piece of writing gain these titles? Think about the following. An advertisement for Renaissance, a contract for the sale of a house, a poem, instructions for the use of a dishwasher. Not every text has an author. We need to talk about what kind of relationship is implied between authors and text when we call something authorship. This is another thing we have to unlearn. Historians don't understand the integrated self that underlies joint work. They often unconsciously perpetuate a myth of the lone writer. And finally, they don't understand the concept of authorship. It's astonishing that even now, many of those who argue against Harriet's co-authorship cling to a definition of authorship that equates handwriting a manuscript with being the author. So the argument goes, the manuscripts are in John's, not Harriet's handwriting, so that proves that she did not co-author the text. This ignores the fact that John made his living by handwriting at the East India Company while Harriet was partially paralyzed for much of their acquaintance. And her letters attest, as you can see here, to the difficulty of handwriting for her. You can imagine how hard it was to transcribe this. But most importantly, if this argument were valid, then Stephen Hawking would not be the author of his books because he did not physically produce the text. We also need to recognize that the concept of authorship has changed over time. Multiple writers working on a single text was acceptable, even ordinary, as a way of writing during the medieval period. If any author was named, it was usually the person who copied the text. During the early modern period, as printing became the norm, the possibility of making money from writing offered an incentive for writers to claim authorship. This was the first statue of Anne was the first copyright law in England. So the history of authorship now gets all tangled up with the history of copyright law. Authors pushed for copyright because they wanted money. They wanted to guarantee their income. And some even argued, as Fichte did, for the almost complete identification of an author and a text. He wrote, to steal the form of a writer's ideas was to steal the writer's self. This romantic view of the genius writer virtually eliminated the possibility of co-authorship of a text. Although Contemporary writers are breaking the bonds of a one text, one author assumption. They're unlearning that. The old economic prestige award system still operates to restrict collaborative efforts and to suppress recognition of collaboration when it does occur. Here's this 81 year old who has to insist read the last paragraph. Everyone assumed that he had done all that work by himself. That's what he wanted them to assume, but we were equal partners. All these things were done jointly. He just couldn't share the credit. And I didn't say anything at the time because at the time wives just didn't do that. What time was that? 1960 to 1990. 
not the 1850s. Even in the most collaborative of arts, the power of being named a director of a film continues to be assumed to be singular and male. Slumdog Millionaire had two directors, a woman and a man, but when they got nominated for awards, only the, the guy got to be claimed to be the director because they said, oh, you can only have one director per feature film. This year, if you notice, Soul, uh, which is an animated film, was co-directed by a black person and a white person. And guess who didn't get, not, didn't get the nod until a few days before the Golden Globes when he finally got acknowledged as the co-director. Now, if you're two white guys, Joel and Ethan Cohen, the Cohen brothers have always managed to get both of them nominated for directors. But philosophy is not exempt either. Simone de Beauvoir is another famous example of a philosopher whose partner, John Paul Sartre, failed to recognize her as a collaborator in his work. The remaking of the 20th century men, you could just say, re unlearning of that. So the history of the concept of author evolves over time. It intertwines with questions of money, notions of genius and misogyny. Clearly, the assignment of authorship is not a straightforward task. So where do Harriet and John fit into this history? I think there are three sources of evidence that suggest themselves. There's the evidence of collaboration with others. Did they work with anybody else and, and was it acknowledged? There's the collaboration with each other. What evidence do we have of that? and the actual textual evidence. Now, none of these is foolproof, but we need to examine each of them. Both Harriet and John collaborated with other writers before and after they worked with each other. This kind of biographical evidence of a work habit helps establish their disposition to work jointly. Let me set the stage. It's 1831, Harriet is 22 years old, pregnant, and mothering a nine-month-old and a toddler. She was publishing poems and essays. She was sending the love of her life provocative essays about women's rights. She was also sending articles, some of her ideas about women's marriage, divorce, and education to William Bridges Adams and William Fox, who was the editor at the time of the monthly repository. Her words were used verbatim in articles in this periodical. Now, it could have been that these men saw themselves as co-authoring these pieces with Harriet. They were published anonymously, so no one would know that they were collaborated on, but did they acknowledge this collaboration? You guess. Key, Fox made a private key to the anonymous writings in the journal. And of course, he identifies Adams and his, himself as the singular authors of these pieces. Instead of acknowledging collaboration with Harriet, even privately notice, they plagiarized her work. John, too, was experimenting extensively with collaboration. Furthermore, in his handwritten bibliography, like Fox's Key, I might add, John notes several kinds, several times that he collaborated in a number of di different ways with a number of different writers, beginning with his father. And in addition, Jeremy Bentham, who was his mentor, he claims that he, John, augmented and completed Bentham's narrative. Now, Bentham didn't say this, but I think it's interesting that John here is taking credit for work somebody else did. So he isn't always just acknowledging others. He writes that the Board of Control altered some of his work 
He acknowledges that Alexander Bain suggested editorial improvements to one of his works. He recognizes the co contributions to the subjection of women made by Helen. But the most important piece occurs in 1831, that same year that Adam and Fox were stealing Harriet's ideas. John describes a joint project with his friend, George Graham. I have just put the finishing hand to my part of a work on political economy, which Graham and I are writing jointly. I've written five essays. Graham is to write five more on the same subjects. We are then to compare notes, throw our ideas into common stock, talk over all the disputed points till we agree, and then one of us is to write a book out of the material. Graham is to add a sixth essay on a very important part of the subject, which is above my reach and which I am only to criticize when it is done. This work was never completed. However, John, careful description of their division of work is an important bit of evidence that shows how he and Harriet might have collaborated. These are all the words of a man careful to give and to take credit where credit is due, unlike William Fox. There's also evidence, both private and public, that Harriet and John's intimate working relationship began early on. Eliza Flower, who was an intimate friend of both of them, and actually was the composer, by the way, of Nearer My God to Thee, wrote a letter to Harriet saying, did you or John do it? Eliza incorrectly believed that they were both working on a piece that had appeared in the monthly repository but it is the assumption behind that question that's important. By the time they worked on the principles of political economy in 1846, Harriet's letters are further evidence. She wrote to her husband indicating the depth of collaboration that she had with John Taylor or John Mill. I do certainly look more like a ghost than a living person, but I dare say I shall soon recover some better looks when we, are, we get to Brighton. I think Kisha shall not be able to go before the end of next week, being just now much occupied with the book. The book, The Principles of Political Economy, has been the work of all this winter and is now nearly ready and will be published in 10 days. Because of the extensive contribution Harriet had done on this work, John wanted to at least dedicate it to her, but John Taylor would not allow it. So there was no public announcement of her contribution in this text. Although she does say to um, William Fox, actually, she writes a letter and says, maybe it's better that I'm not mentioned because it'll get a better reception if it's in John Mill's name alone. It is clear from the private letters then of Harriet and John that they worked together closely on many projects. There's still other evidence for their co-authorship that is public, primarily his autobiography. Listen to this passage. I've often received praise which it is my right, I only partially deserve. The writings in which this quality has been observed were not the work of one mind, but the fusion of two. He adds, up to this time, I have spoken of my writings and opinions in the first person singular, because the writings, though mostly revised by her, as well as enriched by her suggestions, were not, like the subsequent ones, largely and in their most important feature, the direct product of her own mind. Notice that John distinguishes the revisions and expansions of the earlier collaboration with the direct contributions of her ideas in 
later texts. John honestly uses the plural we and us and our to describe their later work. In addition to their habit of collaborating with others and each other, their co-authorship is obvious when you compare the text that Harriet wrote long before these ideas were published in often his name alone. But because no one had published all of Harriet's writing until the end of the 20th century, most historians who claim that Harriet did not co-author John's work were blind to her writing on these subjects. They didn't know how often her texts were used exactly as she'd written them. And even now that Harriet's words are available, there are only a few of us that insist that she wrote them jointly. So now let's turn to three specific texts Harriet either wrote or co-wrote, The Enfranchisement of Women, The Newspaper Writings, and On Liberty. Let's see where on the continuum from collaboration to co-authorship these works fell and what ideas they worked on together. 